Hey guys, this is John and I'm playing Dr. Ron Q. Hamburger, <laughs> rated 2030. This is a climbing the rating ladder game. Let's open with D4. I was debating what to play, but let's just go with the move that I mostly play, especially in classical chess. Okay, so knight f6. We'll play c4, we'll go for a main line. I sometimes play knight f3 on move two, but let's invite the main line and see what happens. My opponent in the chat said, this is a strange pairing. I'm going to say I'm recording for YouTube. <laughs> Hope you're all doing well, by the way. Always a possibility someone might not like that or they don't, you know, want to have their game be in a video, which I totally get. So I'm being upfront with them here. So I'd like to roll with this because this is a good player and They've got a free shot at my rating, basically. I think they lose five points if they lose this game. But if they win, they get 119. So, I don't know. I kind of like that risk-reward. <laughs> there is a rating filter. So, just in case, you know, you're in a situation like this and you don't want to play up in rating, you can always use that filter. Okay, so they play g6. Let's go knight c3. <laughs> this is funny. Let me uh, move my webcam here so you guys can see this. So you can see we were talking a little bit. They said, sorry, I had to refill paper in my printer. I did not mean to make you wait. Playing on the job, you know. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do at this point, I'm just going to stall for a couple minutes. Just to make it even on time, and then we'll go from there. And you can feel free to fast forward this part of the video. No worries at all. Okay, and we're back. I'm going to go ahead and play E4 here. We're in the main lines of the King's Indian defense. Now I think, I think we're going to get into it. I'll just show you the chat one more time. <laughs> My opponent said, oh, wait, I looked. You're John Bartholomew. And I told him that this will be in a video that I'll post tomorrow. And I said, at least they'll get one view. All right, so it seems like a nice player here. Now, let's play knight f3. I'm going to play the classical variation. I'm most familiar with this, knight f3, bishop e2. In truth, there are so many different lines you can play against the king's Indian. And I often do play d takes e5 here and go for the exchange variation. I think that's a pretty good practical weapon, but let's, let's castle and go with more of a full-fledged game. On knight c6, I'll play d5, kick the knight. Black usually plays knight e7 here. This is another juncture. White can play knight e1, knight e2, or the move I'm most familiar with, which is b4. This is the bayonet attack. Looking to get in c5. Black plays knight e8. This is an indication black wants to play f5. And I think I can go c5 right away. Just trying to remember. It's been a while since I played this variation. Yeah, let's do it. And on f5, I'm going to play knight e2. I'm going to pivot back with my knight. This is a typical maneuver. It helps reinforce e4. It also allows for the knight to come to c4 in a lot of cases and try to apply pressure to the, to the black center and queen side. And this is the appealing thing about the king's Indian defense from black's perspective. You can get into these battles where, let's say black plays f4 and starts trying to sneak these pawns on the king side forward. Black is attacking me on the king side, despite both our kings being castled there. Whereas I'm only attacking kind of a vague area of the board. Center, queen side. Yes, I already have some pawns kind of up in black's grill here. But the stakes are a lot higher for white, in a sense, in some of these lines. Which is not true for all lines in the King's Indian, but definitely in some of these classical main lines. If something goes wrong for me from the white side, I might just get mated. Whereas for black, if something goes wrong, they may still have a playable position. All that being said... The engine does heavily prefer white in these variations, and the stats are better for white too, overall. I think sometimes the engine can exaggerate white's advantage. That's been a known thing in the King's Indian for quite a while. But, you know, it's, it's give and take, right? All right, so black did end up playing f4, and now king h8. I wonder if this is a prelude to knight g8, trying to organize some sort of knight maneuver, maybe open up the queen. Now, I'm most familiar with the plan of playing a4, bishop a3, b5, and trying to 
open up multiple attackers against d6, possibly a5, b6, if I get all the way there. And I don't see a reason to disrupt this plan, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Yes, I have to be wary about g5, g4, but it's not yet supported for black. I have my bishop and queen kind of posted there. If ever black brings this knight back to f6, well, that's one less defender of the d6 square. Black plays a6. I don't really like that move for them because I feel like they're playing on two sides of the board and even investing a single tempo on the queen side in a position that's already pretty fast like this, despite only one pair of pieces having been traded, is kind of risky for black. So here comes g5. Yeah, again, g4, not a threat yet. I think I can go ahead and play b5 if I want here. Let's do it. And the, question, the, the tension has quickly built here. If I get a chance, I might play the move b6 and really put the question to black's pawn structure by attacking the base of this chain. You can imagine b6 threatening the pawn on c7 could be a domino effect of captures here. If black takes on b5, I'll take with my pawn most likely. Maybe I could consider taking with the knight, actually, now that I think about it. But pawn would be my default option. Okay, and I'm going to get to the side here. Yeah, normally pawn takes is just the logical thing to do, trying to renew the b6 threat. But knight takes has some value because the pressure on d6 is annoying. Sometimes black goes rook a6, though, in response there. If I take with the pawn, I don't think I have to worry about rook takes a3. That seems kind of far-fetched. Maybe their plan is to play d takes c5, bishop takes c5, Rook takes a1, queen takes a1, and then g4. Reckoning that my queen is no longer assisting from that square. If so, I see the value in that. Um, I have something like queen a3 maybe at that point. Looks kind of awkward. I think I'm going to take with the pawn. I'm under five minutes now. I don't want to spend too much more time. Let's force black to a tough decision. Still thinking about b6 if I get a chance. But wow, look at the tension. Look at the, the disparate structures here. It would be really pretty if I got the b6 move in and black was you know on the verge of doing something like this. But even this position just screams tension and conflicting plans to me. Okay, rook g8. Yeah, again, that strikes me as a little slow. This rook g8 move. So b6 is the first thing that comes to mind. I could try to take the sting out of the g4 move by playing something like f3 or h3. Not the biggest fan of going f3 because I do think black might just renew the threat. So my instinct is keep the pedal to the floor here. Yeah, and I think I see a reason especially to do this now. If black takes on c5, I think I can play b takes c7. And regardless of which way black takes, there's a fork with d6 on the next move. Forking either the two knights, if black plays knight takes c7, or the queen in the knight, if black takes with the queen. So that looks nice. And I might be employing some misdirection here. If black takes on b6, I could think about taking with the knight, but I could also think about taking on d6. So, okay, black plays knight g6. They seem content with the queen side burning down. So take, if they take with the queen, I've got some nice options. Yeah, I still don't think I have to panic or anything on the queen, on the king side yet. So let's do this. This comes with tempo. Maybe black's going to go queen f6 and just allow these pawns to be captured and then hope for the best. But now the g file even is kind of clogged, so... If black's intention with rook g8 was to attack down the g file, that seems kind of far fetched. Yeah, queen d7, but I have the fork at this point. Knight b6. That's got to be good. Let's go for it. Yeah, fork the queen and the rook. My opponent said, okay, gg in the chat. So that's the end of it. All right. Let's think. Thank them for the game. So, a little anticlimactic. 
Again, I know that can happen sometimes in climbing the rating ladder or just in any game I post on this channel in general. You guys seem to like it when I post pretty much everything, um, not trying to like pick and choose which games to post. And that has been my policy is just post everything. So I will post this one. We can talk a little bit about the strategies of the two sides in this King's Indian variation. Again, I think Black had an idea of what to do. This is a common plan, 98 F5, but... There's such a fine line between a controlled attack and spending one or two moves that don't accomplish much and getting a lost position in this variation. And I kind of think King H8 and especially A6. Like I think A6, if I had to single out a move, that's the one I would question. That being said, I mean, if Black had played D, D takes C5 here, Bishop takes C5, Rook takes A1, Queen takes A1, G4. I have to do some calculating because F3 is a destructive move if black gets that in. Hitting my bishop and the pawn, most importantly, trying to wreck my king situation. Notice how I, in front of my king, didn't move any pawns. I didn't want to make it any easier for black to reach me and make contact with my structure. So I kept the G, H, F pawn all back. So we'll check this variation. Yeah, much of this was theory. You know, I'm not too familiar from this point forward. Like I would think G5 here is the, the theoretical thing to do. Maybe knight f6. King h8, I'm not too familiar with. a6, again, could be handy. I could see, you know, in the case I took with the knight, if black were to play rook a6 and try to have the rook hold that pawn laterally. But it didn't really work out that way. And I think by the time we get about here, the position's looking pretty dire for black. I think they need something, something quickly here or it's gonna all come falling down. I mentioned if... D takes C5 at this point. I wouldn't even have to take back on C5. I can take on C7, which I think wins the game because if queen takes, then there's D6 with the fork protected two times by the knight and the queen. And if knight takes C7, this is also a fork. Maybe black can play B5 here, but I, I doubt it. I doubt it that that works. So, okay, let's click into the game review. All right, I got a clean bill of health from the engine, 96.6. That doesn't mean I necessarily played a perfect game, but, um, you know, it's a nice number to see for sure. All right, so d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7. You know, it's really interesting if you force me to choose between the king's Indian defense, bishop g7, and the Grunfeld, which is d5 here. I think the Grunfeld is more sound, if you will, than the king's, king's Indian. I think it's quite difficult for white to prove an advantage against the Grunfeld, whereas against the King's Indian, I'm not going to say white is better in multiple lines, but I trust in the number of possibilities and the number of ways white has demonstrated to apply pressure to black's position over the years, over the decades, because black has really given up a lot in the center <laughs> when you're playing the King's Indian. You're allowing these pawns all out there on the third rank, I've mentioned this before in videos, but there's a strong resemblance to the Peart's defense. Black adopts the, the same formation, pieces in the same spot. It's just that in the Peart's, the pawn is back on C2, whereas in the King's Indian, the pawn is even more aggressively placed for white on C4. So white has a ton of space in the center, sometimes even plays F4, which is the four pawns attack, and takes an enormous amount of space, even though this line isn't considered to be the most challenging. So I, that's why I wouldn't recommend the King's Indian for especially lower-rated players, like a, below about 1,600. I do think it's just a difficult opening to handle. You really have to know how to play in a cramped position, how to counterattack, how to time your chances against the enemy king. Because as you saw later in this game, if you miss one or two moves in some sort of critical sequence or counterattacking situation, those pawns for white are coming at you pretty quick because I already have them up here on the fourth rank and oftentimes soon the fifth rank. So that preamble aside, d6, knight f3, this is all standard. I also play f3, which is the samish or zamish variation, looking to play bishop e3. There are so many different move orders. I mentioned f4. There are lines you can play with bishop e2 and bishop g5. There are lines you can play with bishop e2, looking to move the king side pawns up the board. Sometimes white doesn't even play e4. 
You can go for a Fianchetto type approach along the lines of a Catalan. And there's a dozen other systems I'm not even mentioning right now. But Knight F3 followed by Bishop E2. This is the traditional way to play it. Bishop E2, by the way, is a more constructive move than Bishop D3 for a couple reasons. You can see Bishop D3 is even, even given a full mistake by the automated analysis. Bishop D3 runs into Bishop G4 to some extent with a pin. And also, white weakens their defense of d4, which could be highlighted in a variation like this, especially if black continues with knight c6 or e5, because that bishop gets in the way of the queen helping out in defending d4. So bishop e2, although it appears like a more passive square, and I have fielded that question before, why not bishop d3, why bishop e2? It's actually a more useful square. It breaks the pin in advance and allows the queen to communicate with the pawn. So e5, this is all standard. Many of you know this, but even though white has two attackers and black only has one defender, if, let's say the game goes like this, if white decides to take the pawn on e5 with the knight, black has a counterattacking move, which chess.com just destroyed my analysis of. <laughs> Thanks, chess.com. But take, take, queen takes, rook takes, knight takes e5. Black has the counterattacking move, knight takes e4. And this is all well known to King's Indian players and in the King's Indian defense literature. This hits the knight on e5 and enables black to gain at least a quality, uh, maybe even a slight advantage. Because if white gets greedy, knight takes f7, trying for some sort of desperado, they actually lose a full piece. Bishop takes c3 check, b takes c3, and now king takes f7. Black has three minor pieces to white's two. So the tactics work in black's favor. Now, the way I advocate playing this position in my d4 course is playing knight d5 here. So you take on e5, you trade queens, then you play knight d5, hitting this pawn on c7, also menacing bishop g5. And after knight takes d5, you can take with a c pawn. And black is fine here if they play this correctly. But in the short term, it's a pleasant situation for white where black has to know how to fight back against this pawn. White has bishop g5 coming with tempo. White can support the d5 pawn with bishop c4. Again, black can equalize here, but it's a line to look into if you're looking for a simple and effective variation against the king's Indian defense. You're not going to be knocking people out in you know 20 moves or something, most likely, but it produces pretty good results, especially at the amateur level. You can also play bishop g5 here. That's a more complicated version of the exchange variation. So yeah, I kind of have a, you know, a penchant for playing D takes E5 here, but I've also played a lot of castles, which is the main line move. Another option for white is to play D5 and close the center, but then black often plays A5. They do play a move on the queen side and then knight A6, and they get a bit of a grip on the B4 and C5 squares, which can be hard for white to fight back against in my experience. But this is a... Perfectly legitimate variation as well. This is the Petrosian variation. This is the other thing about the King's Indian defense. So all of the mainline systems I mentioned at the outset of this analysis apply, but there's also like sub variations, you know, like here, we're already in the Orthodox variation 6E5, and we have this move, um, <laughs> this, this D5 move. We have castles, which is more classical. And even after knight C6, you can see the name changing Arnon. Timonov defense. I've almost always played d5 here, but bishop e3 is also quite a large variation too, where white looks to defend this pawn and just kind of build around the center, intending knight takes d4 if ever black takes. This produces more of, more of a strategic battle. There's more play in the center. Uh, in fact, I think um, one of your guys' favorite YouTubers and mine too, Daniel Narditsky, he, in this position after castles on move seven, usually plays e takes d4 from what I've seen. There's a bunch of theory here. e takes d4, knight takes d4, knight c6. Uh, bishop e3, I think Danya has played this, you know, probably a couple hundred times from the black side against good opposition. White, white's usually, again, trying to build around the center here. This is far less of a king side versus queen side battle. Play is gravitating towards the middle in this case. So... Just tons of different variations in the King's Indian. I find it hard to follow that from the black side. 
Hence why I don't recommend the King's Indian, along with the aforementioned problem with uh, the lack of space. But some people like that. You know, I'm not going to sit here and claim my way of thinking about chess is the only correct way, because it's definitely not. That would be super boring if it was. Some people revel in variations that are similar but subtly different, and in those subtle differences offer chances for counterplay, especially if the opponent doesn't know it nearly as well as you. So to each their own. But I do think if you're lower rated, it's just a tough opening to play without feeling like you're navigating blind. You know, you might you might get some real interesting attacking games, but you're going to be confused a lot of times too. <laughs> so I tend to think something like D4, D5, more of a classical opening, maybe a Queen's Gambit decline, Queen's Gambit accepted, Slav, semi-Slav. I think those are more in um, the realm of what is useful for a beginning player to learn. But King's Indian, hey, if you like it, and especially if your results are decent, by all means, go for it. All right, so knight c6. This challenges the center, and I do go ahead and play d5, knight e7. This is the typical post. So with the center closed, this is where white starts tilting towards the queen side, usually, and black tilts towards play on the king side, especially by moving this knight and preparing f5. The board is so closed here, you got to think about ways to engage the pawns. This is not a situation where... You can just throw a minor piece out or something and hope for the best. The pawns are going to be driving the action here. So remember that. The more closed the position, the more relevant the pawn play is, typically for both sides. And that doesn't mean we're going to close our eyes and stop calculating, but notice what happened with the pawns. I played b4. By the way, let me click into the opening book for a second. You can see the lay of the land here. We are still in very heavy theoretical territory. Uh, more than 17,000 games in the chess.com database here. 91, top move, weird-looking move. But uh, it's actually similar to 98 in the sense that it allows White's pawn to come to f3, which can be super useful. White's also looking to repurpose this knight to d3, which helps with an eventual c5. So if this happens, this is not the main move, but just to show it, f3 is a useful way of supporting the, the center pawn. We see this in lots of other openings too, but just allowing a little more comfort here with the defense. So tons of theory there. Knight d2, similar idea. Looks like a more awkward square, but that's that's a legit line too. Third most popular move. But yeah, b4, I learned this variation, the bayonet attack, uh, from some books by Alexander Halifman, who's the former FIDE world champion. He wrote a popular series of books um, openings for white according to Kramnik. So he constructed an entire pretty comprehensive opening repertoire based on Kramnik's games. And Kramnik was a big bayonet attack player, especially back in the 90s. He kind of put this variation on the map for white and had a lot of success with it from the white side. And it is the most direct way to try to get c5 in, in particular. So I think I'm going to stop talking about theory because you can see we could just go down the rabbit hole. My opponent played 98 at this point, which is the third most popular move. But yeah, black can also try to play the F pawn forward by moving the knight forward, sometimes hinting, hinting at knight F4. Yeah, white plays this rookie one move. A lot of times I've played this myself. This is an attempt to meet uh, knight F4 with bishop F1 and actually hold on to the light square bishop. So real nuanced stuff here. Black can try to fight back with A5. I usually play bishop A3 against that. That is a case where playing the A pawn forward is actually useful before, before white really gets some momentum. But let's see, 98. Yep, I went ahead and played C5. Looks like knight D2 has also played a fair amount. Yep, F5, and now knight D2. Just a useful reinforcing move. If takes, I want to be able to take back with this knight so that I have both these pieces trained on the defense of D5. And also I'm making way for knight C4 in a lot of cases. Yeah, so black played f4. I kind of think that move is premature. It has been played in 28 games, but white's stats are pretty good here. Ah, uh, okay, knight f6, I remember. Yeah, this, this looks familiar. And again, white can think about f3 or a4 even. Something like this. Just clicking through some, some moves here. Yeah, this looks like a little more what I'm familiar with. Rook f7, this allows for bishop f8. So b5, black can play this and reinforce the pawn, which is now hit three times, but also 
defended three times. This is a more coherent strategy for black. They, ha they have the green light to play h5 and g4 eventually here. And they're trying to hold out just long enough in the center slash on the, on the queen side. But it can get wild. I mean, yeah, I can't even begin to penetrate the theory here. I'd probably play something like a5 in this situation, maybe even allow this. But, I mean, this can get wild. <laughs> just one glance at the position, you can see all the tension. And it looks kind of slow what black's doing. But if black gets on top of you with g4, the, the counterplay comes so fast, you might not have a chance to react. And black often lands pretty devastating blows. So I think that's kind of perhaps what black was was angling for, maybe was familiar with in this type of situation. But they played f4 right away, which kind of tips their hand. Uh, let's go back to the game. Yeah, f4 right here. I'm going to throw the engine on here too. So I continue with knight c4. And king h8, I just don't really get that move. I think if you're already committing to playing f4, I think g5 should be played. And let's just toss out some natural-looking moves. Yeah, knight f6, bishop a3, knight g6, b5. Again, you can see I'm, like, ready to crash through. Maybe they take, play rook f7. Yeah, I remember stuff like this from the Holofman book, too. a5, trying for this, but... You know, good illustration here, g4. This move comes just in time where black is defending it twice. And f3 is, is unpleasant. And actually, the engine's already showing, you know, a tiny, tiny advantage for white, if, if at all. If I keep going, yeah, a takes b6. Let's just go a little bit further. I'm just trying to illustrate some scenario that might occur. f3, and that hits hard, again, because it's two points of contact. When we're opening the enemy position, we love the double points of contact. Let's say takes, takes. Yeah, if I dare to take here, I don't know. I feel like things are opening up. Black's queen, which has not yet moved in this game, could very quickly enter on one of these squares. Suddenly, this is the scenario I'm talking about where my king is looking exposed and on the brink of disaster. And yeah, I've got a nice picture going on on the queen side, but Black's king sure isn't on the queen side. That's more of the type of scenario that black has to angle for. And notice in that entire sequence that I just played out, black kept the queen side moves to a minimum. Black kept the pawns back, much like I'm trying to do. Yeah, they play a takes b6 and then rook takes a1, but those are pretty forcing moves. And they're not, they're not voluntarily investing that much time to play them because white's responses are kind of forced. So I think, I think this is in line with my assessment, like king h8... I mean, it doesn't move the needle that much, but enough that it's appreciable. You know, three-tenths of a pawn, four-tenths of a pawn. And I get a4 in. Black still hasn't played g5. And again, I, I really dislike a6. It is in the top three moves. I mean, maybe the position's already kind of tough for black. But let's go forward here a little bit. It actually now suggests I should play f3, but bishop a3 seems okay. Now it's saying b6 perhaps try to fight back on the queen side interesting that just doesn't quite seem in the spirit of the position okay yeah now here's where i was debating a takes b5 versus knight takes b5 let's see on a takes b5 d takes c5 what's going on here as i mentioned this possibility where i thought maybe black gets in g4 and although i have some pressure here Probably black can fade it. Yeah, this too. I would much rather, if I flip this around and look at it from black's perspective, which looks really weird, <laughs> but I would much rather have some scenario like this than what happened in the game where black just never got in G5, G4. It still looks clearly like white is pressing on the queen side, but knight G6 stepping out of this. Yeah, I can take this whenever I want, but again, this queen's going to come here pretty quickly. I have to reckon with with uh, f3. Looks like I have to start thinking about some countermeasures. Yeah, g3, which looks awfully scary because f after f3, if their queen ever lands on h3, I can get maiden on g2. Uh, bishop d3, I assume, similar idea, so that f3 doesn't come with a, a two points of contact situation. 
But yeah, there's a lot of Kings Indian games where black can lose a bunch of material and still end up winning, still crash through on the king side because in a situation like this, all black needs is that queen to land here. So might be correct to start trying to, to snake it over regardless of what, hap what happens on this wing. And of course, the engines are just great in these positions because they see through all the tactics. Okay, so D takes C5, probably the best try there, but black played rook G8, and now I got this B6 move in, and I was feeling really good about this. Yeah, if G4, I was planning to take here because now black is going to lose material. Okay, still not too late to cause some complications. Take on B6. I was thinking take here against that. But okay, yeah, I mean, this is still a fight. Again, I might have to start thinking about a defensive move. Maybe I take here instead. But yeah, even a scenario where black gives up the exchange just to distract me for a little bit could be viable. But knight g6, I take here with tempo on the queen. Yeah, queen d7. I think black saw if they go here, I can take on b6 with tempo. Probably would have done this one. Maybe knight b5. Yeah, knight b5, I guess, is a move I could see myself playing too. Trying to, again, work in a fork. It is coming crashing down on d6 and potentially towards a8 as well. But black went queen d7 in the game. I got the fork in, and then they resigned. Honestly, even here... I would not fault black for playing on at all. You know, I know this seems ridiculous, but it's time consuming to go win the rook. If black just charges forward here somehow, you know, g4, let's say. Bishop takes, yeah, knight f6. I'm kind of cheating because I'm looking at the engine. Um, maybe there's a better way to prepare it. Let's say, um, let's say knight f6 first, even. I guess I'd probably go after their light square bishop, but even if there's a hint of some complications. Might be worth playing this for black because the main target is my king. I'll say it again for the half dozen time. The target is my king, and that, that's scary for anyone despite my extra material here. Okay, so hopefully I impressed upon you how, let's say, committal an opening like the King's Indian is, especially when you're playing against a good player. Black is giving up so much of the center. They're seeding so much space. They really have to know what they're doing. And Dr. Ron Q. Hamburger, which is a great name, by the way, sounds like a Simpsons reference. <laughs> um, they had some ideas in mind, but they seemed a little disconnected once we got here. F4, King H8, and again, especially A6. And I felt like my strategy of trying to arrange the pawn play and distract Black before they got going on the king side, by the time we got about here, was clearly working in my favor. But even then, there might have been some ways for black to, to create complications, like D takes C5 here with the idea of trading rooks and quickly playing G4. Like I really think G4 is the key if you're going to commit to F4. There are other plans too for black, by the way. Like sometimes when there's the tension back here, sometimes black will wind up taking or just return the knight to F6. But if you commit to F4, it should be with the intention of pretty quickly pawn storming, keeping the other moves on the other side of the board, the queen side, to a minimum. Whew. Okay, so that's an overview of the King's Indian, some of the lines that I think are important. Hope that was useful to you guys. Thank you, Dr. Ron Q. Hamburger, by the way, for the game. Very kind of you in the chat. I'll make sure to edit this so we fast forward through the, you know, the time that we both uh, stalled a little bit at the beginning. And thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll be back again soon with another video. Bye, guys.